Good afternoon, and welcome to the first seminar of the Financial Literacy Seminar Series. I want to first welcome back our usual attendee to the Financial Literacy Seminar Series, but also I know that today we have some out-of-town people uh, attending CFED conference, and so welcome uh, to our series. We hold them every two weeks on Thursday, so if you are in town uh, on Thursday, uh, you are very welcome to come here and attend the seminars. We are delighted today to have a distinguished financial literacy speaker. We have a distinguished speaker each semester, and this time is Professor Sheldon Garon from Princeton University. Uh, just a brief introduction, if you don't know him already, he's an historian from Princeton, and this is a presentation about his new book, Beyond Our Means, Why America Spends While the World Saves. This is the fourth book of Professor Garon, and for those of you, uh, or if you haven't read it already, I have to say, I haven't read the previous book, but this book is simply magnificent. It's very rich, uh, very full of uh, uh, facts, stories, um, and it really teaches us, I think, uh, so much about, um, for example, thrift and lack of savings and attitude toward consumption and savings across countries, and um, we are truly delighted to uh, have him today. Another feature as an economist or another thing that really strike me about this book is how beautifully it's written. Um, and I, I was so impressed by this book that I'm actually going to read uh, a piece from the book. Uh, this is just a little piece. The entire book is written so beautifully uh, I know that you have to be a high caliber person to be at Princeton in the history department, but this book certainly shows it. Um, and this is uh, just among many pages. There are many, many pages, and they are all so written with this subtle sense of humor as well. Um, this one just, uh, I think, hopefully shows, again, the elegance, and it talks about Mary Poppins. <laughs> and how it was described in the UK versus the US, it talks about the father, and he says, joined by a cast of musty bankers, he encourages his children to experience the joys of savings, and in the musical he sings, if you invest your tuppence wisely in the, back, in the bank, safe and sound, soon that tuppence safely invested in the bank will compound, there is a rhyme. Michael and Jane would have none of it. They are the two children. Create, create creatures of the new age, the children spend that tuppence. They buy bread to fill the birds, their act of consumption sweetened by generosity. But no longer would the word thrift roll off the tongues of America, nor would dedications to prudence or temperance adorn banks, and city squares. I tell you, no economist would be able to write with this beautiful <laughs> prose. And um, this book is entirely like this. It's just a great book. And we have bought several copies, but we're going to buy a lot more. Maybe this will be a gift uh, to the participant. So join me in welcoming Professor Garon. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Lasardi, for that, that very, very kind introduction. Uh, it's a real honor to be here and to, and to kick off uh, the Financial Literacy Seminar this year. And thank you also for the opportunity to, uh, to talk about my book in some detail. Uh, when I first began working on this project, saving money was not exactly a sexy topic, uh, certainly not in the United States. Uh, where policymakers have long emphasized consumption and credit uh, as the engines of economic growth. Uh, still, uh, after the 2008 crisis, in some ways, uh, saving has been sexy, uh, at least exciting, maybe not in the best terms. Uh, 
Uh, millions of Americans today, as most of you know, lack the basic savings to protect themselves against life's emergencies, against job losses, against home foreclosures, against health emergencies, and against the prospect of very uncomfortable retirements. Uh, and as many of you know, uh, CFED, the organization located here in Washington, recently did a survey, a household survey, and found that something like 43% of American households have little or no liquid saving. And the Federal Reserve Survey of Consumer Finance, uh, uh, which recently came out, more or less confirms that number or around that number. So this book is in part a history of how we Americans came to so privilege spending over saving, but it also tells a larger global story about how people in many other nations, East and West, learned how to save over the past century or two, and also learned how to strike a little bit more of a balance between saving, spending, and borrowing. And this, of course, is very much related uh, to your theme of financial literacy. So in a sense, this is an attempt to historicize financial literacy in the modern world. Now, it's well known, and, and I am a historian of Japan, so, so this is something that very much uh, has been on my radar screen for a long time. It's very well known that East Asians, starting with the Japanese in the 1970s and currently the Chinese, boast very high household savings rates. When people, economists, try and explain this, often they fall back on cultural explanations. They'll say, well, OK, East Asians have this kind of abnormally high savings rates, but that's because they have something called culture. Some, sometimes they say it's Confucianism. Sometimes they say it's Asian values. But there's something peculiarly cultural about this, at least so the explanation goes. Uh, the problem with that explanation is seen very clearly uh, when we look at some cross-national tables of household savings rates. And lo and behold, we find that actually the Japanese have come down quite a bit, not, not terribly good savers nowadays. Uh, whereas a lot of the high savings today, interestingly enough, is done in continental Europe by, by really the core economies of continental Europe. Uh, the French, the Germans, uh, even the Swedes recently have, have boasted pretty high rates. You could look at the Belgians, you could look at the Austrians. Um, this is over the last 30 years or so, but even earlier they would have had even higher savings rates. And what's awfully interesting about places like France and Germany is how their household savings rate has held over the last 30 years. Uh, even though in other places with aging societies such as in Japan, they have gone down. Now, a simple um, table like this tends to actually confound a lot of the economic analyses I've seen that try to make sense of, of saving on a, house, uh, on a global basis. Uh, because in many ways, according to the economic models we have in this country, Europeans shouldn't be saving much. Uh, they have massive welfare states. And we all know the Feldstein thesis from the 1970s. That, generous national pension systems and other social benefits should disincentivize saving. Well, America has weaker social safety nets, and we have low savings. And Europeans have very elaborate safety nets, and they have higher savings. This shouldn't be happening. Um, aging society, many of these European societies have rapidly aging societies. That people are supposed to be spending down and not saving up. And yet, look at the constancy in a place like Germany. So, Clearly, we may need, I'm, I'm not trying to disparage economic analysis or economists here, and certainly not in this room, um, but, uh, but we may need a little bit more. We may need help from some of the other disciplines who might think about these measures and these explanations in different ways. And to a historian like myself, what tends to bring together a lot of the high saving societies over the last century or century and a half is that they have rather long histories of actively promoting saving among ordinary people, among a, a phenomenon that used to be called, and still in other countries is called, small savings. So I'm not talking about large investors in this talk or in the book. I'm talking about ordinary people, small savers. And whether it's Japan or whether it's several of these European cases, they have long 
histories, as I'm going to show in a few minutes, of actively promoting saving. And they've done so by means of various institutions that I'll elaborate upon, and also sometimes even moral suasion campaigns and the use of, of, of schools and things like that. Again, something I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to spare you the details that are in the book's 12 chapters, but what I'd like to do in the next 45 minutes or so is to sum up how Europeans and Japanese created institutions that promoted small saving, and then I'd like to consider the various ways in which the United States has diverged from the practices of small savings promotion seen elsewhere. And the first uh, thing I'd like to do, I'd like to show you the history of a, a variety of institutions that were created in the modern world to promote small saving. Go through the European Japanese side, then talk about the United States story. And the first institution we start with um, is a set of, of, of savings institutions called savings banks. Uh, this was really marked, uh, starts about 200 years ago, about 1800, in several European countries. It's a transnational phenomenon, and what I mean by this is savings banks would start in Swiss cities and German cities. They'd spread to Scotland by the early 1800s. They'd spread to England. They'd spread to Sweden, uh, to France. They were seen as big social reform ideas at a time when reformers all around Europe, and indeed around the world, uh, were thinking about ways of dealing with the rising problem of the urban working poor. So this is one of many social institutions. Uh, what is a savings bank? Well, um, you should think of it not so much in terms of a financial institution in, the, in modern terms. It's really a social institution. The savings banks were originally started by philanthropists, by civic organizations in, in cities around Europe. Uh, they were designed to accept very small deposits, the sort of deposits that only uh, that the working poor could could barely manage. The idea was to get the working poor to regularly to save, to have a savings account, to actually get interest on these accounts. And it was interesting that there was some sort of calculus at the time that went on for decades and decades that you had to have a visible interest to attract small savers. And it had to be about 2.5 to 3%. And that, that, that figure is remarkably constant in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And to get to that figure, often um, philanthropists went into their own pockets or civic organizations would contribute. So they were actually, in a sense, subsidizing savings. So they were not, these institutions were not originally designed to make money, although in fact once a lot of these savings banks got established, they did make money. Uh, but they were designed first and foremost to serve small savers, to serve the working poor. Now the founders of these banks did not use our modern term financial inclusion, but they actually had concepts that were remarkably similar. Uh, because the reformers would argue that if everybody in the populace regularly saved in banks, that, they, that their inclusion would make them self-reliant citizens, and they used words like self-reliant and citizens, that would make them responsible members of the community, uh, they would be allowed to plan their lives and of course there was a conservative tinge to this. By having people financially included, then the working poor uh, would not depend on the dole, uh, that they would be less likely to turn to crime, their families would be less likely to break up, uh, and by the middle of the 19th century, the argument was even made that for workers, to, for them to have a financial stake in the country, this was a term the British reformers used, they had a stake in the country, they would be less likely to actually revolt, to engage in social revolution against the country. So all these sort of motives went into an idea of it was saving as citizenship. That's the language they would have used at the time. But, but it has some resonance today with the idea of financial inclusion. Uh, and you can see in this, uh, this handbill here from the 1850s uh, in Britain uh, that they not only appealed to workmen, but uh, as the decades went on in the 19th century, very self-conscious attempt on the part of reformers to also persuade women both working class women, but in this case, middle class women, the so-called housewife, to keep careful household accounts and to be the saver within the family. 
And you're going to see this spreads to East Asia uh, by the end of the 19th century. So savings banks was the first of these experiments, uh, did a lot in terms of financial inclusion. Lots of the working poor, um, whether they were domestic servants or, or the new mechanized workmen, uh, began participating in a way that simply really wasn't possible before about the 1780s. I mean, ordinary people did not have bank accounts before the 1780s and before 1800. So this is a, a major change in people's economic behavior. Now, the second institution that came after the savings bank coincided with them uh, was something called the Postal Savings Bank. Uh, I'll talk about this, this, uh, this image in a minute. Uh, postal savings was another one of these uh, social reforms of the 19th century. Uh, the first one was created in Britain, the Post Office Savings Bank in 1861. And just like the savings banks, it became one of these transnational phenomena that very quickly spread as this bold, innovative experiment in social policy. After the British established it, the Belgians a few years later established a national savings bank also using post offices. And the third country, the third independent country to adopt a postal savings was Japan in 1875, which had just become a modern nation uh, just a few years before, just seven years before in 1868, but one of their first governmental policies was to adopt this British model of postal savings, and in a sense the rest is history in Japan if you, if you follow um, the debates that have raged for the last 20 years about the Japanese. It's all about their postal savings system, which grew so large after it was established in 1875 that today it's not only the world's largest postal savings bank, but it's actually the world's largest bank in terms of assets. Now, that may not be a good thing, but, uh, but that is what happened. And then these, these postal savings systems spread everywhere. Uh, they spread uh, to almost all the other countries of Europe. Uh, they spread to Canada. They spread to Australia. They spread to many uh, British and French colonies as well. And I show you an image here to show you how big postal savings was in the world about a, a century ago. If you went to Central Europe, and you can still do this today, and you're into architecture, some of the best architecture in Budapest in Vienna is actually their Postal Savings Bank headquarters. Uh, this is the one from Vienna. It's, it's stunning. You can go in. It's a museum today. It, it also actually still serves uh, as for, for some postal savings. It's this modernist building built by an, one of the, the great modernist architects at the time, a man named Otto Wagner. In Budapest, the Royal Hungarian Postal Savings Bank is just stunning. It's this Central European Art Nouveau, very fanciful. But what all these show is how the, the level of resources and prestige that a century ago governments put into postal savings because it was seen as the hallmark of the most advanced social policies in the world at the time. Now, why is a postal savings bank rather effective in terms of financial inclusion? Well, it does three things. Uh, one, like the savings bank, it takes very small deposits. It takes even smaller deposits than, than savings banks could do, partly because economies of scale. Uh, you had you know, millions of people in some of these countries participating. So it took very small deposits, very good for youth, very good for lower income people. Another thing it did that the savings banks could not do is it came with a state guarantee. So you had the government's guarantee that you would get all your money back, which is no small thing. Because for savers in the 19th century or American savers in the 20th century, you have lots of bank failures. And Believe me, it's not a very good incentive for a small saver if they think their money's going to burn up or be embezzled or whatever. Uh, so having the state guarantee was very important toward persuading some reluctant small savers to begin to entrust their savings to an institution that obviously they had no personal connection with, but because the government stood behind it. And the third aspect of postal savings that was extremely useful for financial inclusion was access. Um, this is a period, mid-19th, late 19th century, when modern nation states around the world, one of the ways that they showed that they could knit their people together was uh, by creating post offices everywhere in a national network. And so you had in places like France or Britain or Japan, 
or Canada or the United States. You had thousands and thousands of new post offices being created during the latter half of the 19th century. Uh, by putting a savings bank inside the post office, it meant that people who lived in the countryside uh, or in provincial uh, towns that had not had access to big banks or even savings banks uh, had access to their local post office. So it was extremely useful in terms of creating nationwide networks of small savers. So this is the postal saving system, the second institution. And a third institution, uh, again roughly from the latter half of the 19th century, was the school savings bank. Uh, this was also another product or byproduct of the spread of modern nation states that you began to have more and more elaborate public education, mass education, compulsory education, often managed by central governments in places like France and Japan and elsewhere. Uh, and it occurred to education and uh, social policy reformers that the best way of getting your populace to be thrifty and to save and to plan their lives was to, um, to at a very early age, expose the future citizens uh, to these habits of thrift and regular savings. So have them save right inside the school. Um, it, this, idea of the, uh, the school savings bank cropped up all over Europe, started in some German cities, uh, but particularly the Belgians first put it into effect nationally in the uh, 1860s, and this is an image. Belgians prided themselves on great thrift in the 19th and early 20th century. In this uh, particular drawing for Belgian school children, the self-righteous pigtail here uh, is talking to these rather dissolute children who have come out of the candy store, the confiseur, they're stuffing their faces, and she's saying, no, 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 do not spend your centime on candy. Take it next door to the Caisse d'Epargne, the National Savings Bank, often at a post office. And that's what you should be doing. The school savings system, just like everything else here, spreads transnationally very fast. Uh, it's in Japan by the 1890s. Uh, and again, it's in lots of countries. And you have an interesting phenomenon. I mean, we, we don't pay attention often to the mundane of events in history, but one of the mundane events was, you could call it kind of transnational Monday. You would have had all over the world, from Munich to Manchester to Melbourne, even to Minneapolis later you're gonna see, you would have had this image on Monday morning of school children bringing in their small coins, uh, giving them to the teacher or a savings bank or a postal savings clerk, uh, these people would then write it down and it would be then deposited in the local post office or savings bank in the name of the children. And they were expected to regularly save uh, and uh, it was meant to incorporate and as I said inculcate uh, habits of thrift. And these two, like everything else in terms of inclusion, the numbers are really striking. I mean in each country you had a large percentage of particularly primary school children the main people who are attending school in those days, um, are enrolled in these savings banks programs. So you're reaching a lot of children. Now, another phase in terms of the promotion of saving occurs in the 20th century, and that's the phenomenon of war savings. You know, particularly during the, first, the, the two world wars, uh, you have these very elaborate nationwide savings campaigns. We're somewhat familiar with this from our own country. Uh, but it's a very interesting new stage in saving. Because in the 19th century, in terms of motivation, you're basically trying to persuade ordinary people to save for their own good, to save for the good of morality, for the good of social order. But in World War I and II, you now have these massive protracted total wars. They're extremely expensive. Uh, you can get some of the finance from taxation, but there are limits to how much people will pay in taxes. So the idea of financing a good part of the war out of people's savings, because you, you can't borrow from your enemies anymore. The Germans and the French would borrow from each other when they're fighting each other. You can't do that anymore. Uh, so you're, you're heavily mobilizing the domestic saving of your people. So savings takes on a new meaning. Not only good for the soul, not only good for society, but now it's essential to national survival, to financing these wars. 
And what's also interesting about the war savings is there's nothing like war to standardize government policies. Because when you're at war with somebody, you are constantly looking at what your enemy and sometimes your allies are doing. Uh, if, they, if your enemy can do a better job of financing their war and keeping it going longer, you want to do exactly the same thing. So in terms of the campaigns themselves, they're very transnational. They tend to emulate each other, and they emulate each other's propaganda, which is why you have the set of these two things, in this case we have allies, the British and the Americans, uh, but it's no coincidence that they suddenly decide to use Joan of Arc. Uh, they, first of all, who's left to mobilize at home? The men are all away, so you've got to mobilize the women. So the women come into a new role here. It's kind of the saver citizens, the patriots on the home front, and saving is one of the ways that they have to show it. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is actually the American poster came first, even though Americans came into the war much later. And if you want to know why the Ameri it, they, it came first, um, English don't actually like Joan of Arc. <laughs> um, they, they fought like this Hundred Years' War against her, and then they burned her at the stake and all that. Um, so, so it was actually the British propagandists, uh, you know, probably wanting to get to the pub early that day, they, they simply just ripped off the American poster. Um, but you see a lot of this, uh, and I mean, I could go on and on, but I won't in this talk. You see a lot of emulation of posters and of messages. That's the important thing, messages on how you motivate people to save. And just continue on this theme of using women as the savers. Uh, you can just see in the, in the juxtaposition of these two posters, the American poster, uh, the woman on the home front, she's, you either do one thing. If you're the men in the background, you fight. If you're the woman on the home front, you've got to buy bonds. And this gets transmitted to peacetime Japan in the 1920s. You get basically the same image of the mother, the saver, and the men working now because they're not off at war. But this idea of this gender division of labor, the idea of the centrality of the housewife as a saver. Uh, now, um, we move into World War II, uh, and more or less these, these campaigns continue. They're even on a more massive scale. Uh, this was uh, said to be the most popular poster in wartime Britain. Uh, it's interesting because it strikes us as so un-American uh, today, uh, because this is the squander bug. And the squander bug was the person who, by spending money rather than saving money at war, uh, for engaging in the crime of shopper's disease, uh, he was AKA Hitler's pal. Uh, and and I, I had, I had the, the sort of the mirror image of this. My book came out uh, at Christmas time in this last year, and I was on NPR and a lot of these stations, and I was constantly accused of undermining the American economy by telling people not to go shopping, but that it might actually be important to restore their household balance sheets. Uh, so it just kind of shows how far we have come. But these sort of messages were there. The idea that spending in wartime could actually be a traitorous act. Uh, well, after World War II, we have really sort of the fifth and the last institution of, of saving or motivation, of promotion of saving. Uh, and this is the post-war national savings campaign. And these are interesting. I think Americans don't appreciate these, and you'll see why in a minute. Uh, but World War II ends in 1945, but the wartime-style campaigns for savings and austerity do not end in most of the rest of the world that had fought the war. Uh, they do end in America, and we'll talk about that. But in places like Britain, um, they have a new set of post-war austerity campaigns uh, called the Keep On Saving Campaigns, uh, telling people that, yeah, okay, in the middle of 1945, you know, we've defeated the Germans, uh, we're about to defeat the Japanese, but we have to keep on saving for the post-war. We have to keep on saving because there is a lot of wartime destruction in all of these countries, Britain, continental Europe, Japan, they're in shambles, their cities have been bombed, they're heavily in debt because of their wars, uh, and also, something that you might not have thought about, and you see it in this poster here, also in Europe, Britain and others, uh, there are the plans for the post-war welfare state. So you see a blueprint here for what, not only defeating the Japanese, but the blueprint for education, for housing, for health, for roads, for lots of public spending, and it can't all be financed by taxation. 
uh, the, new, the new campaigns are you have to keep on saving. There's got to be continued austerity, but buy people's savings. It will, at a fairly low cost, finance post-war recovery and also the beginnings of the post-war welfare state. And again, not just in Britain, uh, but I, I brought this for Professor Lusardi. Uh, in Italy, you can see you know, the passbook here, but the destruction there. In other words, financing for reconstruction. In France, the same theme, reconstruction bonds and savings bonds for reconstruction. So this is a very big thing. And you know, today when the Europeans talk about austerity and Americans say, well, how can you use such a stupid word? Who could possibly ever love austerity? Well, it actually has an emotive response from Europeans sort of going back to that period, not, not suggesting we're in the same period, but that the word austerity was a way that a lot of these countries historically saw that this is how they came back, by biting the bullet, by saving, by investing in their country's recovery. Um, so that's the European experience. In Japan, also massive post-war savings campaigns. And interestingly enough, in the Japanese case, the post-war savings campaigns just keep going and going. Uh, so in Europe, by the end of the 50s, most of these countries are really tired of savings and austerity campaigns in Europe. But in Japan, the savings campaigns run right out of the Bank of Japan, run by something called the Central Council for Savings Promotion. Uh, which still continues in a form in the Bank of Japan. These campaigns go on and on until about the 1990s, intersecting with women's groups, nationwide savings campaigns, and constantly talking about the need for a national thrift and, and the generation of domestic savings for Japanese industrial policy to invade, invest in industry and not to buy too much foreign uh, products coming in. So there are all sorts of economic nationalism that are tied to these things. Now, I should say that even though the Europeans pretty much have dropped the overt savings campaign by the late 1950s, in some ways, the institutional promotion of small saving continues very much in Europe today. And I just wanted to show you two or three examples. Uh, in France, there continues to be a very popular small savers instrument called the Livre A, or the A Passbook. Um, it was actually created in 1818, I mean, to just show you its longevity, although it's had many transformations. Uh, but today, you can get it at the savings bank, you can get it at the postal savings bank, and even in France today, since 2009, you can actually get them at commercial banks, because commercial banks wanted these as well. What are they? Well, they're tax-free. Uh, they have a tiny, tiny minimum balance. They're capped at about 15,000 euros, so they're intended as a small savers vehicle. They have, no, um, they have no fees whatsoever. So they're very accessible to lower income people, to youth savers. Uh, there's something like about 50 million of these held in France today, which is roughly the population of France. So it's just, it's universal. It's an interesting idea that we might think about, because the French government actually commissions private banks as well as the public banks to subsidize basically the small savers instrument. Uh, that's France. Uh, in Germany, um, it's not so, the promotion of savings is not so much done on a national basis, but as you know, Germany has very strong regions and they have these very strong public savings banks that are in the municipalities. Uh, if you go to a German town or city, I mean, you can't cross the street without bumping into one of these, these Sparkassen, Sparkasse the plural, savings banks. They, too, go way, way back uh, to the early 19th century, even the late 18th century for some of them. Uh, they are highly accessible. They are set up for savers. They, they have youth savings accounts. They have a lot of contractual savings plans where you agree. I mean, it's sort of like our 401k, but it's for everyday savings, not just retirement savings. Uh, you make contracts, you're going to deposit this much, they'll take it out of your paycheck. Uh, and they're very, very accessible, as we say. And they're, they're also known as they, by law, have to engage in lots of investment in the public good, and they have to loan locally and things like that. Um, also, we should mention that in lots of places in Europe and East Asia, you now see not so much the school savings bank of the old days, uh, but you see modern financial education programs. I mean, this is one that the German savings banks do. This is actually a comic book, which is 
believe it or not, the most widely circulated comic book in continental Europe is actually put out by the German Savings Bank Association. And um, it's called, any Germans here? Nobody? Okay. I, I can tell because usually at this point, if there are Germans in the audience, they get teary-eyed because they have such emotional attachment to this comic book. But it, you know, but it's this, like, it cultivates this very cute, cuddly image. I'm not saying this is all financial education. There's a lot more elaborate programs, but, but this is kind of the public face of it in Germany. In Australia now, there are nationwide financial education. In Japanese, there's nationwide financial education. And this seems to be a growing trend, the use of the nation's school system. So that's how, how, how uh, financial inclusion works even to this day and really piggybacks on this long history of savings promotion. Well, let's move from that uh, to uh, the United States. How does the United States fit into this global picture of uh, savings promotion over the last 100 to 200 years? And the answer is it doesn't fit very comfortably. The United States in many ways is different from these other patterns, both in savings and in credit, as we're going to see in a few minutes. Um, not totally different, but let's start with the spread of savings banks, this 19th and early 20th century phenomenon. How does this look in the United States? In other words, institutions for small savers. Well, in some ways, it's very transnational or transatlantic on the east coast of the United States, particularly from the mid-Atlantic states up to New England. Uh, in the early 1800s, uh, you see lots of American reformers very much tied to the English and others, and sometimes German savings banks. Uh, and a lot of savings banks are founded in the northeast of the United States. Uh, so very, a real density, a little bit in some of the cities of the upper Midwest and on the cities of the Pacific Coast. The problem was that the small savers institutions did not spread very evenly on a nationwide basis, and they didn't spread to most American states. And this is, in a sense, the American story of savings in general. Parts of the US very much are tied into this global process, but a lot of other parts simply are not. So if you go to the southern states, the western frontier states, there is almost no financial access for small savers as late as 1910, really as, until about after World War I. Uh, and there are actually are interesting measures you can get from the US Comptroller of the Currency at the time, uh, where they actually count the number of savings accounts, and you can put them over the population figures for the state, and you get very interesting um, uh, results as a result, and, and it shows that the New England states have a real density of savings institutions. That's something like 54%. Okay, it's not quite 54% of people have a savings account, but it's that the savings account per population, it's the only way we can do it. Um, but 54% in the New England states, and then you look at the 13 southern states in 1910, and this was not an insignificant part of the country then. These were. There was a, actually a lot of population in those 13 southern states. 3.4% the number of savings accounts per population. And in the western states, not the Pacific Coast, but the western frontier states, 4.6%. And in the great state of Texas, uh, less than 1%. Yes? Are you counting the uh, credit unions and savings accounts as community banks in there? Uh, OK, that's a very good question. This does. This doesn't count what were called the building and loan associations, which were the predecessors of the savings and loan. Uh, if you put them in, you would get on a nationwide basis, rather than about 16%, you get 18%. So it's not terribly significant. But the other thing is they, they, they are major institutions, uh, not, as, not as many customers at that time as the savings banks. But the problem is the building and loan associations are pretty much in the same areas that already have a density of savings banks and other small savers institutions. So they're not particularly in the southern states or not in the western states. So it, it, it doesn't change the regional picture much and just adds a little bit of a percent. Now in the post-World War II period, the SNLs will be very major as, the, as, as probably the way that most Americans actually save which is interesting because then, of course, they disappear and then we have to talk about that. Um, now, credit unions, uh, credit unions are just beginning to be created at that period. This is 1910. There are very few credit unions. They will start to appear. The credit union story is an interesting story. They're not measured in this. That's right. Um, even though credit unions are very heroic, uh, they have never really 
uh, done a lot in terms of total market share of small savers. They have, uh, you know, recently there have been, you know, changes in the rules that make them more accessible. You know, often they were restricted to organizations. Uh, they have done a good job for the people they've done a good job for, but they haven't reached huge chunks of the population in the way that some of these other institutions might have or, and actually did. Um, but yes, they're, n they're not in this, but they wouldn't have changed the 1910 statistic. Yes? Right. Yeah. Yeah, but you know it's interesting. Okay, uh, you can take Vermont, and uh, which is a pretty rural state, and has a huge percentage of people in savings banks. Uh, I mean, the Southerners have towns too. They don't. <laughs> they don't. I mean, small towns, and they're not there. Vermont has small towns. I was another interesting case. Uh, Iowa doesn't have so many of these so-called mutual savings banks, but has a lot of what's called stock savings banks. That they're kind of commercial banks, but they're still very much they're, they have joint stock ownership, but they're still very much oriented toward small savers. And there are something like 550 of these stock savings banks in Iowa, which makes it one of the most densely uh, populated in terms of, of, of savings banks. And yet. Iowa is one of the most rural states there is. So, so it, it, does, it, it partly tracks what you're saying, and certainly in the frontier west, but, uh, but it's not the only answer. I mean, and, and in the book I talk about this, and I could go on, but let, maybe we can come back to that point. Okay, so, so there's a variation um, that for the first 100 years or so of savings promotion, the Americans are sort of way behind or at least very uneven in their promotion of saving. Uh, well, so if they are uneven, wouldn't the smart solution be to start a nationwide postal savings bank? And in the 1870s, there were people in Washington who thought exactly like that. They were just like social reformers and reformers around the world. And they said, wow, United States, we're coming out of the Civil War. We've got to integrate the country. The post office is expanding. Why can't we do it, the British or the Belgians or, or the Canadians? All they had to do was look north and, and, and say, well, why can't we set up a postal savings system? So in 1873, um, officials from the Postmaster General's office, these cosmopolitan bureaucrats who were studying European trends, uh, they, um, they drafted a bill. They gave it to sympathetic congressmen in the US Congress to introduce 1873, and nothing happened. And then they introduced in 1874, nothing happened in 1875, nothing happened in 1876. They introduced it for the next 37 years, and it went nowhere, um, which is kind of like what might be happening today to crazy people like me who suggest maybe we should reintroduce it. It will go nowhere. But anyway, um, why did it go nowhere? Well, uh, commercial banking was much more advanced in the United States at that point than it was in, 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 in a lot of other places. And the commercial banks, as you would imagine, fought tooth and nail. They certainly didn't want something like this vying for small savers. A lot of regional opposition, even based on populism, fear that if you had a nationwide savings bank, all the money would, would, would go somewhere. It would go to Washington. It would go to buy government bonds in Washington, or it would go to Wall Street. And they didn't like things like that in, in, in populist areas. So congressional regional opposition, finally, because in 1907, there's a major financial panic in this country, it prompted enough congressmen to decide that they could pass a weak postal savings system, uh, which they did. Uh, it was more or less crippled at birth. Uh, it, uh, it was prevented, it, it charged effect, it, it paid effectively 1% interest rate uh, at a time that the banks were paying 3 to 4%, so it was way below the market. Uh, it was supposed to spread to the countryside, uh, but uh, within a couple of years, the post office under pressure decided that the so-called third and fourth class rural post offices wouldn't have them. So the whole thing was designed to do to reach the countryside. It didn't do. Uh, a lot of other things, it was prevented from working with schools and school savings banks because the banks didn't want them coming in. Uh, and uh, you know, for a time, it did well. It did well in World War I. It did well in the Depression when people were, uh, because it had a government guarantee. Uh, it did very well with immigrants. Uh, it was seen as the Italian bank because Italian immigrants just loved it um, because it resembled what they had at home. Um, but 
It receded for various reasons, and uh, in the 1950s, it became almost invisible. Um, I'm old enough to actually have been a child during this period. I didn't even know we had one. Uh, and nobody knew we had one, because in 1966, it was abolished by Congress, and everybody said, well, what do we abolish? I mean, no, nobody could remember it was even alive. It sort of just kind of died in its sleep. Yes? Was there something else in the loop? Because I went to Catholic school in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania in 1950, mm -hmm. okay. in elementary school. Okay. We had a little book that we bought, games. Yes. And we were saints. Wasn't it Sunday school? Well, OK, it might have been. It's, it's, you could get those at the post office. Those, those were hooked into the U.S. Savings Bond Program, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, it was a program designed, um, uh, it's, it's not exclusively American, it was actually designed in the 19th century in places like Britain and Belgium. The idea was that in order to lower the transaction costs for children of saving, because you, you don't want a kid bringing in a penny and trying to make a deposit. So the idea was if they pasted up, uh, you know, a, a hundred of these penny things, or, or nickel, 20 of them, uh, on a sheet. Then you brought it in, and then you could get a US savings bond or whatever. I mean, I don't think I gave you the right cost, but that, that was the idea. Lower the transaction cost. I used to bring in the stuff. Right, right, right. OK, but let me get to that. OK, schools, since we're talking about them, school savings banks. To what extent did we have them in America? Uh, well, again, there were educational reformers in America, very much taken in the late 19th century by these European school savings banks. Um, I show this one from my home state of Minnesota, uh, sponsored by the big savings bank in Minneapolis at the time. Uh, I actually showed this image in, in Heidelberg, Germany uh, a few months ago. And uh, the audience said, well, how'd they get Americans to line up so orderly? <laughs> and I said, well, well that's easy. They're, they're all German and Swedish immigrants. <laughs> um, and there may be something to that. Uh, you, you, even if I was just pandering. Um, <laughs> because there's, a, like everything else, there's a real unevenness in school savings banks, just like every other institution. And think about America. Education is very decentralized here. So if a school board decides they want to do it, OK, then they can do it. But then beyond that, you actually have to have a bank that's willing to take the children's tiny, tiny little savings. And it's usually. A, a loss for them, uh, although the enlightened ones could argue they might have future customers. So as a result, because we had very few savings banks, uh, at least evenly distributed, in most places, even if there was a school district that wanted to do it, not that many wanted to do it, you couldn't necessarily find a savings bank to do it, and the post office was pretty much prevented from doing it. Uh, so you had these pockets of these school savings programs, Minneapolis, New York City, actually Los Angeles, uh, and, and places like that. But again, in large parts of the country, school children never got exposed to these, these sort of institutions that were so common elsewhere. Um, well, World War II, yes? So the, the story you've told a bit about um, you know, sort of opposition to yeah. social savings is commercial banks essentially not wanting competition. Mm -hmm. We did, actually. I mean, I mean it, 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 the story is an interesting one. Um, and I, I was warned that economists would ask questions in the middle. Historians never do that. So I'm, I'm sorry if I'm falling behind in my timing, but, but I guess you're all used to this, right? Yeah. We, we have this kind of 19th century gentleman's profession, so I apologize. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. That's, uh, that's been brought home to me. Um, OK. so. <laughs> It is very interesting, and this is an argument I make at the end of the book for why, why postal savings might be like the public option of today, if you think back to the national health insurance debate of a couple of years ago, uh, the national health care thing. Um, because in 1910, as, as postal savings got close to being passed and commercial banks had to fight against it more vigorously, and then when it actually went into effect, 
Indeed, that was the very moment that commercial banks started dropping some of their more onerous requirements of high minimum balances and started being more socially friendly to small savers and actually getting their business once they saw that there actually was a market there as a way of trying to compete and to forestall um, what, uh, what the US Post Office was doing. And so I have made this argument that I don't think is totally frivolous that you know, if, if we could reintroduce postal savings today, one of its products, I mean, I actually think it would do a lot of good, but we can debate that. But, but even, even if not that many people went to it in the end, if it actually stimulated banks to compete for small savers and realize that maybe they were being a little extreme in, in sort of chasing away or having very high balances in fee structure, that they might actually get business, that there is the business out there. So, that actually is what historically happened. So the commercial banks did get into it more, particularly in the 1920s when people had their World War I savings bonds and they cashed them in. The commercial banks did pretty well. The problem was that, of course, a lot of these banks and savings and loans then folded <laughs> in the early 30s. So you know we were back to the old problem. But, but they did get more aggressive in competing for that, and that's true. Uh, so that is my argument, that, that government intervention doesn't, doesn't have to be a total takeover. It can have a stimulant effect. But OK, so uh, I'm, I'm working my way through. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so in World War II is really the time that the US most resembles uh, the rest of the advanced economies of the world in terms of the US government centrally getting involved in the promotion of small saving. And they do it in two ways, uh, the US savings bond. Uh, which was actually a new institution. World War I, it had these very expensive liberty bonds. They were inaccessible to a lot of people. But the US savings bond that we know today, um, the type that you give for bar mitzvahs and births, and well, nobody does that anymore, but they used to in my day. Um, this was found in 1935, right before World War II, but really caught on as the war bond. Um, after, after the US entered the war. Um, and it was a very elegant solution to some of the problems of financial access. Because if you didn't have savings banks and building and loan associations all over, um, the savings bond was highly accessible. It was accessible in two ways. It was accessible in the sense that it was quite affordable. It cost you know, $17 something, you bought it, it was administratively simple. You waited 10 years, you cashed it in, uh, so you didn't have to worry about interest payments in between. So very elegant in terms of, of use for small savers, but also accessible in the sense that it was available everywhere. You could get it in your school, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of school children, pasted up the stamps, which led to the bonds. Uh, you got them at the office. And you know, some of you were probably old enough to remember the payroll savings plans, which continued in post-war um, uh, United States. But in, in the midst of uh, World War II in the US, some 27 million Americans were regularly saving you know, about 10% of their paycheck, which instantly, at the source, we say, was used to buy these savings bonds. So payroll savings, you got them even from the neighborhood woman who was like the war bonds committee person. Uh, you could buy them at the banks until very recently, and banks are now sick of them because they, they see them as competition and a nuisance. Um, uh, but you could at the banks, and you could at the post offices as well. So they, so they were, in a sense, part an American answer to, to the absence of some of these small savers institutions. And the second US institution that really promoted small savings, not so much before the war and during the war, but right after the war was FDIC. So FDIC is passed in 33, comes into effect in 34, doesn't hit people that much in the 30s, partly because there's, there isn't that much saving, um, but there's also still a lot of suspicion. I mean, it takes a while. But after 1945, um, people begin to cash in their savings bonds, which was the major way that most Americans saved, was savings bonds during the war. They didn't have many savings and checking accounts, but they, they did have savings bonds. They cashed them in, and they started putting them particularly into the savings and loan associations, which were a highly accessible, again, kind of America's answer to the savings bank because they're highly accessible, friendly to small savers, by law could pay a little bit more percent for savings than the commercial banks. Uh, and so FDIC, by really overcoming the American problem, our long American problem of bank failures, 
uh, was in a sense our real answer to postal savings, because here's, here's in a sense the government guarantee. Now some of you who really know your history will know that the SNLs are covered by a weaker system than FDIC, which becomes a problem. It becomes a problem when it becomes a problem, which is in the 1980s. It, doesn't, it isn't a problem before, and it, it assures people for many decades that they can put their savings there. So, so, all of, so, so in other words, there's a lot of federal intervention that makes small savings. The, really, the golden age of small savings in the US is from the 1940s to roughly, uh, probably sometime in the 1980s. And it has a lot to do with federal institutions, directly or indirectly. Well, we get to um, the 1980s. It is interesting that in the post-war period, uh, that Americans were pretty good savers. As I said, this is our golden age of small saving. Um, we weren't saving like Europeans and Japanese, but there are reasons I'll explain in a minute. We didn't really have to, but we had savings rates between about 7 and 11% as recently as 1981. And then, I think you all know the story, the savings, the household savings rate just falls off the cliff in the 1990s and the early 2000s. How do we explain this? I'll try and rapidly bring this to a close. Uh, we can talk about long-term factors and short-term factors. Long-term factors, the United States comes out of World War II in a different position than really everybody else in the world, except for maybe Canadians and Australians. Uh, the United States does not suffer war damage. It doesn't have the bombed out cities. Uh, it's Factories are not destroyed, but they are humming. They're easily converted into consumer goods production. You have American standard of living has actually risen during the war, so people have, have been saving, but they got a lot of pent up demand. Again, a different story than any of these war ravaged places, either ally or access. Uh, and so, as a result, consumption, I mean, new ideas, I would call them American interpretations of Keynesianism and other things take over. The politics in both parties, the politics from both labor and management, um, begin to very much privilege consumption as the driver of the economy. So not so much saving and investment anymore, but consumption. And in a sense, this thinking about consumption as the, really the hallmark, the primary goal of the economy, begins to start even during World War II in the United States. And I show you two posters here. During the war in places like Britain and Germany, people were told to save so that after the war they might consume a little. Uh, you can realize your dreams, and you can see the British version, the British woman, war worker, she's, she's working and working and saving and saving, and she's dreaming of the post-war when she can have a little garden and a hand-powered lawnmower. What are Americans dreaming about in World War II? This is a school uh, newsletter put out by the US Treasury Department to hundreds of thousands of American school children in 1943 telling them what happens with your, your war bond that you buy in 1943 that matures 10 years later in 1953. What is the world in 1953? Forget about hand-powered lawnmowers. You can buy a private air car. You can vacation in Madagascar, Alaska, Hawaii. You can weekend in Mexico City, Newfoundland. You can buy television sets, radios, telephone answering machines. You can buy anything you want. And it points out that your war bond is going to be just the down payment, because you can borrow the rest to buy it. Um, so we, we begin to have very different American formations. That's one long-term thing. Another is housing. Um, I think you all know this. The US government. Um, uh, from the 1930s uh, has clearly the most aggressive pro-housing policy in the world probably, um, you know, with the creation of the FHA, uh, the, the 25 to 30 year amortized mortgage, which is a new thing at the time, makes housing much more affordable, actually brings down the interest rate because you have the FHA and federal agencies basically, you know, insuring, guaranteeing private banks loaning mortgages uh, and in a post-war period the income tax deduction for housing becomes important. It had been there before, but most people didn't pay income tax. So after World War II, lots of ordinary homeowners begin to take advantage of the tax deduction. And you get a phenomenon uh, that Americans begin to think of their saving as through their housing, which is not crazy. Um, that you, you, know, you accumulate a nest egg, it's there for your retirement, you, know, you pay off your mortgage. Uh, and one can say that this was quite sustainable for the first several post-war decades, that Americans managed to both have small saving, 
pretty good rates, um, plus putting a lot of money in investment uh, that was paying off into housing. So you have, these are the long term, but the short term factors are the ones that perhaps are much more important. And they really start from the 1980s, and it's the world that we lived in until 2008, and to some extent we still live in it. Um, what happened since the 1980s? Well, for various reasons, a lot of which have to do with the deregulation of the financial industry, first we see the decline of some of these big mid 20th century institutions for small savers. We said postal savings was going nowhere, but uh, the SNLs, the savings and loan, which had been this highly accessible form, well, we all know what happened, deregulation, um, and many of them then went into riskier and riskier developments, you know, huge numbers, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds failed, and we really, today, we don't really have savings and loan, at least in their, their old form. The U.S. savings bonds are still there, but it's not a very accessible way of people saving anymore, even for children's saving. I mean, they're, they're hard to get. I mean, you've got to buy them online. Uh, they're certainly not offered in the schools or uh, very few in payroll deduction plans, things like that. So that's on the savings side. The credit side is perhaps the most dramatic story. This is where we really don't look like anybody else, at least a few English-speaking peoples, but nobody else. Um, okay, credit cards. Uh, credit cards become a universal commodity after the 1980s. They had been an elite commodity before that, but because of deregulation and things that are complex, but um, it became possible uh, for the credit card industry to no longer be held down by usury laws in each state. They could charge what they wanted. They began to make lots of money on revolving credit, people not paying their credit cards back. Increasingly, they targeted the customers that they called sub subprime. This is before subprime mortgages, but the 1990s, ta targeting lower to lower middle income customers uh, who were likely not to pay back in full because that's where they would make their money. And things got more and more predatory, I would say. Uh, you may disagree. Uh, home equity loans, which nobody really wants to talk about um, because I think they're seen as respectable and the thing that good American homeowners have, but, uh, and, and to, and in many instances they are, they're very sustainable, but in many instances they have not been. There was something, the second mortgage basically, um, that really didn't exist before the mid-1980s and are very much privileged by the 1986 tax reform, which makes only the primary mortgage and the home equity uh, loan interest the only forms of credit that's, that, that continue to be tax deductible. And banks really just explode offering offering more and more home equity loans. And Congress originally thought people were going to just use them for education and home improvement. And then it was clear you couldn't tell people what to do with them. Some people use them that way, but some people use them as their gigantic credit card and more and more. And sometimes when, when we saw credit card debt going down in the, the last 10 years, we say, oh, isn't this wonderful? It's just because people had shifted to home equity loans, which were a better deal for them. Subprime mortgages, I think we know about, and also many primary mortgages as well. Uh, and then finally, all of this huge expansion of credit occurring against the backdrop of growing income inequality in America, uh, stagnation of wages among, among working people, and after about 2000, stagnation or even decline for about 90% of households. Uh, and it is interesting, in the midst of this growing inequality, this is exactly the period that credit expands. And so you could, in a sense, call credit in this country America's welfare policy. Because in Europe, when you get in trouble, you get social benefits. In America, when you get in trouble, we extend you more credit. Um, and so it became this Band-Aid and a rather unsustainable Band-Aid. Well, I'm going to end uh, by I'm just, uh, I'm not going over any of these points, but in the back of my book, I do something really strange for a historian, although maybe more common to all of you. I actually end with policy recommendations because I was at the Woodrow Wilson Center two years ago, and they said you can't write a book like this without policy recommendations. So I ended with policy recommendations. I'm happy I did. Uh, so I suggest a lot of things based on both the global story, what's happening in other countries, but also some things from our own past that might help in terms of restoring some balance uh, to American household finances. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of these. I think I've suggested a number of them. Certainly, I would center on reviving postal savings. Um, this, to me, is kind of a way of killing two birds with one stone, a way of saving the post office. 
uh, which is clearly going down by giving it new sources of revenue. And this is actually happening all over the world, places like Japan and France and, and elsewhere. A lot of post offices have found that their mail delivery revenues obviously declining with the internet and package delivery services, but they're actually making up of for it by expanding postal financial services. So I'm going to end with this saying that you know Americans don't commonly like to pay attention to best practices in the rest of the world, but, but this might be a good time to do so. Thank you very much. I'm going to start with the first question and then take more questions from the audience. My first question, Sheldon, is how come that um, an historian working in modern Japan gets to write a book and is, you know, a world study about savings. Can you tell us a little bit more about what led to this book? Well, I didn't do it in one day. Uh, this, t this took a long time, and it went through various phases. So I, I originally imagined this book in the 1990s, and it was going to be a book exclusively about uh, the, the, the history of Japanese encouragement of saving. Because some of you can remember there was a time when Japan was actually China. In other words, we were deathly afraid of it. It had this highly successful economy in the 70s and 80s. We thought they were going to take over Hollywood and Rockefeller Center. Uh, and their economy, they had this industrial policy. They seemed to be picking everything right. And one of the big keys to that success was held to be their high savings, their mobilization of domestic saving, and the provision of low-cost capital. Uh, so my book was going to be a history of Japanese campaigns and institutions. Uh, well, uh, some things happened. Uh, the Japanese bubble burst in 1991. It wasn't obvious that this was going to be irreparable. Now it is. We got two lost decades of Japanese growth. Uh, Japan, obviously, are not world beaters anymore. Uh, and also, as you saw, their savings rate plummeted. Not so much because they want, uh, became shopaholics, but because their household income actually declined and people simply maintaining consumption levels, which meant their savings rate was largely falling and also rapidly aging society, but I'm not sure that was crucial. So as a result of that, you could sort of say I diversified my portfolio, uh, or uh, unkindly, maybe rats leaving the sinking ship. Uh, but uh, I, I thought, well, uh, at the same time, I realized that the Japan story by itself is not going to sell. Uh, I also, through the documents, because historians, all we do is read documents. And uh, when, you're, when I read the Japanese documents from basically the late 19th century to after World War II, it became clear that lots of these institutions for promoting saving that I thought were so peculiarly Japanese were actually emulated, um, were emulations of this global phenomenon that was happening in, in, in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, postal savings, school savings, all these sort of things. So I realized it was a very much an interlinked, what we call a transnational history, and that's, that's the sort of history I do now within history. So it's going to be a Japan, a Japan and European story, and I wasn't sure what to do with the United States. So I was really afraid of the, the U.S. stuff, because I did talk to economists then, and all the American economists said, well, Americans don't have to save like Germans or Japanese, uh, because in America, uh, people don't, uh, increase their wealth, not on the basis of this piddly little small savings accounts, uh, but they do it by investing in assets and stock markets and this unbelievable uh, housing uh, situation in America. And so they can have much higher rates of return. They don't have to have as high a rate of household saving per year uh, because they get such a great rate on their return. And, you know, and I would ask them at the time, well, what would happen if housing prices actually went down, and everybody said, ah, it's not going to happen. Um, anyway, <laughs> then it happened in 2008, and then I realized I had the rest of the book. I even had the book title, because uh, Japan doesn't appear in it, Europe doesn't appear in it, it's why America spends while the world saves. Uh, and, and I also began to realize that it would be a very interesting story to show, to try and explain globally and historically why the United States comes out differently and what some of the, the, the consequences of that were. I also began to realize only after 2008, as probably many of you did, uh, that, that housing was a huge part of the story, which you know, before I hadn't even thought about housing in terms of saving. Now I, mean, I, I realize how important it is and, and also ways of comparing us with perhaps Germans who have very low rates of home ownership and then tend to try and maximize their wealth you know, through small savings and things like that. So the housing's really important. Even housing size is important. Um, Americans forget that most people in the world 
don't have 3,000 square foot homes. Uh, that, uh, and you can actually look at you know, cross-national housing data, and it's very interesting. Italians actually come out is with tinier places in Japanese. Yeah, right. right. So if you have small house, uh, you don't have to heat it as much, you don't have to cool it as much, uh, and you can't buy a lot of stuff because it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> so, uh, so, that a lot, so housing became very important. So that's, that's the genesis of the book, many difficult stages. Uh, Barbara Cherguino, given the uh, current extremely low interest rates, um, mm -hmm. Doesn't that act as a rather large damper for encouraging people to save? And yeah. how do you think that's going to change? Yeah, I mean, I mean, as I, you know, you remember at one point in the, the talk, I talked about how the people who want to promote saving thought that it was important that people see visible interest rates. And it is interesting in Europe even today, although rates have fallen, but. I mean, this is partly due to European Central Banking policy, which had a higher interest rate. But there, there seems to be in a lot of these savings banks in Germany and Austria and these places that are oriented towards savings, there seems to be less of a spread between the, 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 the interest on loans and the interest on savings accounts because they're offering, they're, uh, I mean, the, the, they're offering rates that are still way, way above 2% in many of these countries. Uh, sometimes even, not, not no longer 3%, but w when we were near zero, lots of places had 3% rates. So, you know, I, I cannot tell you exactly why this is, uh, but it is interesting that, that they clearly thought it was important. The French, this livre a thing is, is really wild. Uh, probably economists would hate it. Uh, but it's an in the interest rate is totally established by the government. It's not a market rate. And sometimes it's above market rates because it's seen as a social policy subsidy. Uh, you know, we may not want to do that, but if we think it's important to subsidize something that's socially useful, and if we think that maybe a lot of our subsidies have gone to the affluent, that this might actually be an interesting way of doing it. But anyways, you're asking, what can we do now? Um, well, it is discouraging to have a low interest rate, but it doesn't necessarily totally discourage saving, and indeed, a lot of examples in the last 20 to 30 years show that, that people will often save when rates are very low if they're scared of everything other investment, which is, I think, where we are today. The Japanese in the early 1990s uh, started buying very low interest postal savings accounts and uh, American uh, economic journalists laughed at them and said, oh, what a bunch of idiots, you know, why, why are they so risk averse, why are they saving at low interest rates? And now we're doing it. Uh, in 1990s in this country, interest rates are actually quite good. And that's exactly the time that Americans stopped saving. So, so there, there's not as good a correlation as you might think, even though it really hurts us to see these small rates. But, you know, people, I think, intuitively think in terms of, of kind of a real return. And they say, well, I could put it in my house. It might drop 30%. I could put it in the stock market. And I have no idea what that's going to do. Uh, OK, maybe I'll lose a percent or two to inflation, but I'll still have most of my principal. And I think that's how lots of people respond. Uh, so, I mean, then there's this larger macro debate, obviously. You know, should the U.S. be, well, Federal Reserve, should, you know, should interest rates be raised? Well, that doesn't seem to be happening right now because it wouldn't have a great effect. But, um, yeah. Two other factors uh, economists tend to worry about uh, in terms of saving is fertility rates, which are on the floor in Europe, and uh, China and Japan, and are going to have really bad long-run consequences for them, mm -hmm. um, given their transfer payment schemes is unsound, you know. Right. So their low fertility rates, and also, you know, they do have high consumption taxes, right? 20% back. Oh, yeah. Back. Oh, yeah. And uh, so the combination of those two could be fairly important. Right, but important, uh, in what sense? I, I, well, you have a <laughs> consumption tax and you encourage safety. Yes, that, and, that, and that, that one I see. fertility, you encourage safety. One child policy in China, holy mackerel, those people are oh, I see. like crazy. I mean, but often, the yeah. The Italians yeah. are have a one child policy voluntarily. <laughs> uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't even yeah, seen the one, you know, but they're, yeah. To the rest of Europe is just not reproducing itself. Right. So they, you know, uh, whereas, you know, I invested a huge amount in my children, they can yeah. uh, hopefully. Yeah. 
that, uh, that I would get my return. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, it, but it's interesting and that. My children moved to Italy. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> But, but there's also an argument made by some economists that uh, actually, well, it's the life cycle hypothesis that when you have rapidly aging societies like Japan, you're going to see a lowering of the savings rate as people have to consume and, and don't have the income coming in. And and th well, I mean, it probably did happen in Japan, but it's interesting. So, so I've, I've seen the demographics used in both ways and actually more commonly in in, in not the way you used it, but the aging society will reduce saving. Yeah. Now, except that it 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 doesn't in some of the European countries, because I mean France has you know better uh, birth rate than most, uh, but the Germans don't, and the Belgians don't, and the Austrians don't, and yet they have maintained these high savings rates. So it's 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 a mystery. I mean, it's a, a single variables. I think are. are can get us in trouble here because I don't think any of them can quite explain it. I was struck by your slide that showed uh, the progression of savings banks in the United States and with them predominantly in the Northeast and Midwest. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about the impact of immigration on that? The Europeans yeah. coming over and bringing their institutions yes. with them. I was also struck by the fact of the very low savings in the South. And is that due to result of the devastation of the Civil War and the protracting of that um, very elitist agrarian society with uh, yeah. the Crow laws. Immigrants is, is a big part of the story, continues in a sense to be a big part of the story. Immigrants in general tend to be high savers, certainly in their first generation, uh, partly because they are still transnational, often are sending remittances as, as the early uh, immigrants, I mean the immigrants around 100 years ago in the U.S. were. Uh, they tend to economize on their costs, you know, like living in crowded places to, to minimize housing things and, and really do focus on the accumulation of saving. But they also, as you said, a lot of them bring their institutions with them. So the gentleman who asked about the savings and loan and the building and loan associations, those are partly British, but they're also very Germanic. They're related to things like, if you've been in Europe, Raiffeisen banks and things like that, um, these agricultural cooperative banks, because a, a savings and loan is, is originally a type of cooperative. Uh, and, uh, and in the Germanic areas, uh, the building and loan associations were big in Pennsylvania and in Ohio. Uh, so this is really important. As I said, Postal Savings was actually called the Italian Savings Bank. Uh, and people in Congress who tried to oppose it said, we want to Americanize those Italians. We don't want to Italianize the US Post Office. <laughs> now, that's a direct quote. Uh, so, uh, so that's important. The South is really interesting. And in a sense, everything I said about the South would apply not just to savings banks, but to an array of social institutions that we could collectively call citizenship. And in a sense, financial inclusion is a form of citizenship. But if you think about the South, the racial divide is enormous. Um, the percentage of African Americans as late as 1910 in Mississippi, Alabama, I think is over 50%. A lot of them are in the 40 percentile. These people have been effectively disenfranchised in almost every way you can think. They have been kept out of the regular schools. They have been denied their voting rights, and in a sense, being denied the right to a savings bank, because there aren't the sort of philanthropists you see in the North or in other countries that are willing to establish savings banks as a way of integrating. Maybe they call them the riffraff, but they think the riffraff are going to eventually be part of their community. That was not a vision among, as you said, southern elites. And so, so there's a real paucity, you could say, of social institutions in the South, including the savings bank. I was wondering if, in your research or elsewhere, you looked at savings policy or behavior in places like um, Central or South America. Yeah. I, um, no, not, not there. I, I, I did pay attention to, uh, to, to some African societies. I never was able to do much with it, but I did go to Senegal and interview the director of Postal Savings and, and went to Mali. Uh, and, and, you know, I've tried to, to, to follow the microfinance and microsavings debates, uh, which, which have some familiar ring, um, because the creation of, of, of savings and credit cooperatives is actually a way that both East Asians and, uh, and Europeans, particularly continental Europeans, uh, really 
sort of finessed the first stage of saving in the 19th century. I mean, they, the, these, these cooperatives actually mediated between the financial institutions and, and the ordinary household. So there is, is something to that. Um, but, but I can't tell you anything about, I'm sorry, about Latin America. Uh, um, and and, and some, of the, some of the savings promotion programs in, in some African countries have been fairly successful. I mean, Senegal, some, some, some in East Africa, South Africa, uh, there have been a variety of schemes, including postal savings, that, uh, that have done a pretty good job, but then there's always the question of access and trust and things like that. Oh, sir, uh, again, looking back to history, as you read through this, uh, if you had been a member of the economics department at Princeton or the business school, we would have, we would have heard a lot of things like risk, moral mm -hmm. hazard, mm -hmm. and, and, and other terms of yeah. art yeah. that uh, you didn't mention today. No. Did you find those in the literature as you looked through? Were people talking about what was happening to this money that was saved? Yeah. Was it put at risk? Was the word risk involved in the social debates, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. No, that's a good question. Uh, certainly, there, there may have been other words, but they are very conscious of risk. And that's why I talked about the security of deposits is a big thing on the minds of small savers. Uh, and it continues to be here, I mean, if you think about it in, in certain areas. Uh, but a very big thing before things like FDIC and postal savings systems and things like that. Uh, and as, as I said, American story, is a, it's a real problem if you don't know if your bank's going to be there next year. Uh, so there's that risk. Now, it is true, I think maybe what you're getting at, and I didn't do a very good job of it in the book, there is an argument to be made that Americans took more risks, didn't necessarily invest in, this, in, in savings banks, but would invest in land in the West and things like that. And I, I think that is an argument. I think there was a social risk involved in expanding the country through the period of history yeah. that you so discussed. Yeah. Was, just see if you saw any of that in the social discourse. The there, there is, there is. And, and American, if I were an American historian, I'd really focus on that because you know everybody focuses on the rise of the populist movement in the late 19th century, and it's all about you know people who got over indebted, farmers and things like that. So, so the risk thing and the try the alleviation of risk are they're always coexisting, and and Americans I think do take more risks, uh, but they also get hit harder in many ways. I think when they lose. I'm curious to hear more about the personal and aggregate impacts. Um, from the two different systems? Does having a more pronounced um, public aspect to how savings work, I mean, it must have substantial impacts on people. You started to seem to talk about consumptive behavior being different mm -hmm. um, because commercial banks perhaps have differently aligned incentives. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what happens to the sort of customers, if you will, of the public sector banks versus the private sector banks how those relationships are different and what the mm -hmm. impacts both on the customers and the societies within them are. Yeah, of course it does depend where we're talking about, but I, you're talking about the places that have uh, active public savings institutions, right? right? Um, there, there, one pattern we see that, that, that you might not expect, in places like Japan, even in Britain, uh, where you have had long histories of postal savings and other small savers institutions that uh, by custom but also by law, uh, the commercial banks often have to grant more or less the same types of financial access. So in Japan today, it's quite extraordinary. By law, any bank's got to take any size deposit, no matter how small, uh, there is no minimum balance, there are no fees attached to it. I mean, that's by law. So in a sense, there's sort of an evening out of the, the private institutions to look more like the public. Uh, and in France, that interesting case I talked about, uh, we have a situation that's kind of hard to imagine in America. So, so for years and years, the commercial banks are complaining about the privilege that the state-linked savings banks and the postal savings banks have over them. They can offer these livre A and these other small savers accounts. You know, the, the public banks could. And so the, you know, the commercial banks said no fair. Okay, so that, that sounds familiar to us. Commercial banks would probably do that here. But unlike America, the commercial banks didn't say, close down your operations in the post office. They said, we want what you have. Uh, so make it possible for us to offer the livre A. Uh, uh, 
and the government came up with a way of doing it. So in a sense, they kind of universalized the public <laughs> onto the private. Now, in places like Germany, you see maybe more of a distinction. Um, Germans will often have accounts in different banks, but they'll attach kind of different meanings to them. Uh, they might go for a higher rate of return in Deutsche Bank, but they might say, but Deutsche, they're not friendly to me in Deutsche Bank, and I don't keep that much there, and I really like to keep it in my local Sparkasse uh, or, or the, the Postbank. Uh, uh, so, so there is a sense that in Germany and some other places that the big commercial banks are meanies. Uh, they, they don't really care about me, but I might just diversify and have something there. Uh, or I might you know, get a, a nationwide ATM, which you can't necessarily get with a local savings bank. But, but the sense is that the, the savings bank is, my, is our bank. It looks out for us little guys, and it invests in the region. And uh, people are very attached to these Sparkassen. In your research, or if you've thought of it yourself, of the of private sector solutions to encourage yeah. individual saving. And the reason I ask is because I know Bank of America had a program that was called like the Roundup program or something like that where it rounded your nearest purchase to the dollar and took that amount and put it into your savings account. I was wondering. But, but it, was, it was the so, yeah. use of your credit card, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. Debit or credit. Yeah. Okay, but it was for spending. So the more you spent, the right. more you allegedly spent. But saved. it also didn't gain much traction. So I'm wondering yeah, if, for good if, reason. You, right, yeah. if you heard of any <laughs> private sector solutions to actually encourage. Mm. Yeah, no, I know. Uh, there should be private sector solutions. And there are a lot of people thinking about these things here. And, and I get dizzy sometimes you know, studying all these, these proposals. But what is interesting is thus far, the marketplace has not done a particularly good job of solving this problem. And in lieu of government action, I'm not sure I see how they're going to get there. Uh, you might have some small solutions, but you're not going to have a big solution. And you know, maybe I spent too much time studying Japan and France. Maybe I like hanging out with bureaucrats. I don't know what it is. But, but the idea that sometimes problems are just so big that you got to solve them from the top. I know that's un-American. But, but uh, I just feel that. <laughs> On this cheerful note, <laughs> let me again.